Hello and welcome to Fintech Insider Insights. I'm David Barton Grimley, Fintech Strategy Director right here at 11FS. And on today's episode, in association with Adyen, we're discussing the impacts that embedded finance can have on businesses. Looking at the time and money that can be saved by having powerful financial tools within close reach. But what next? I'm joined by some expert guests into the embedded finance and payment space to look at how payments can be integrated into platforms to meet the customer where they are. So first off, we have a FinTech Insider debut for Natalie Wexler, VP Platform Offering Strategy at Adyen. It's great to have you on the podcast, Natalie. Can you tell us a little bit about the work that you do at Adyen? Absolutely. So I look after the commercial strategy for the products and services that we offer to platform customers. So essentially what we do is we spend a lot of time thinking about what are the pain points, what are the needs and wants of our platform customers, as well as the uh, the pain points of their customers. So we think about do we have the right products and services to meet those needs, and then the go-to-market strategies that follow. Awesome. And we have another debut on the podcast for Jason Downing, SVP Product Management at Epos Now. Welcome to the show, Jason. Epos Now is very much on the front line of developing embedded finance solutions, all sorts of businesses. So it'll be great to get your insights here. What sort of projects have you been working on recently? Thanks for having me. And on my side, I lead the product team at Epos Now. And we're a customer of Adians. So we run payments, embedded finance, capital cards, uh, and bank accounts. And really our mission at Epos now is to help our sub merchants grow. So we work with many small businesses. Uh, globally, we have 70,000 locations. We're in 10 markets. And our objective is really to give them the tools to, to grow their businesses by themselves across point of sale, across embedded finance. Uh, we're working with them to give them data insights every day so they can run their business successfully. Awesome. All right, let's dive in. So to kick off the show, we'll be looking at the current state of embedded finance and how the technology can have radical implications for businesses. So why don't we start off with a bit of a definition? Um, So Natalie, from your point of view, what is embedded finance? Yes. So embedded finance is when a platform integrates financial service products into their environment. So essentially what they're doing is they're allowing their small business customers to have financial transactions occur in their actual environment, right, in their experience. And so what this does is it really allows the platforms to give their customers an opportunity to have one-stop shop to run their business. Some of the products that uh, that are included in this product suite include working capital loans, uh, business bank accounts, in case the customer wants to manage their money in a visible way, as well as card issuing. So again, it's really an opportunity for these platforms to create a really sticky relationship with their customers and have that one-stop shop to run the business. Amazing. I mean, embedded finance has kind of been around for a while now, and I feel like we're moving into this this almost like a new phase. I don't know if it's embedded finance 2.0 or 3.0. I don't know where it is. But what would you say are some of the more kind of emerging use cases for the tech that you've seen recently? Uh, the use cases are endless. Right. Right. So these, so these products can really service any customer, any small business that is really looking for simplicity, visibility, control, speed over their funds. The point really being having the easiest and simplest and most controlled experience over how they run their finances. Again, the the goal here is really so that they can focus on running their business, Mm -hmm. not managing their finances. And so, for instance, when I talked a little bit about the capital product, do you need funds, an influx of funds to cover an emergency? Do you need funds to grow your business? So investing in your business, you can take out a working capital loan. If you wanted to have access to your funds faster, your transaction funds a bit faster, you can maybe open a business bank account and then also have the visibility and to be able to manage those funds. And if you wanted to have a controlled way to spend those funds, a card, an issued card is a, is a great solution. And this is where payments combines quite nicely with lending and and all of the more deeper use cases. I just want to um, just talk a little bit about um, Adyen from your point of view. You know, you've got UK, US, and now EU banking licenses, which is kind of amazing, right? I mean, how important has that been to building a a platform? It's been a bit of a game changer for us. Uh, We've really been able to provide unmatched speed and control to our customers. Um, So by cutting out the middleman, Right. By having everything under one roof, under the Adyen roof, we've essentially sped up the ability for platforms as well as their customers to access their funds. For instance, with a capital loan, 
the funds can be in a business bank account in moments. Mm -hmm. Accelerated settlement is possible because there is no third party. And then there's also the control. We're not behold, beholden to third party restrictions, right? So when you think about a third party bank, they're servicing a lot of different providers. So they don't allow that flexibility and control to really allow a platform to create their own business. Yeah. They have a one size fits all mentality, whereas we are able to, to work with our customers to really customize the experience that they want. That's really amazing. Um, it, we've been hearing a lot in this last year about banking licenses rights and, you know, Revolut also getting their license um, in the UK. Jason, I want to come to you. Um, what are the major customer pain points that you're seeing? So for those small business owners, really, it comes down to a few, a few common themes. One theme is time. Just, hey, I need to manage my business. I need to go and serve customers and manage inventory and sell stuff um, or bake bread that I need to sell the next day. I really have a short shortage of time. And it's trying to kind of give those business owners more time in their day and take stuff away from them. For the new business owner, very much more around, hey, it's a one-stop platform. You can do all these different things and we can grow with you. Epos now has a marketplace. If you want to kind of add a little app here, or a little app there, if you're doing something different, it's a completely open operating system, so to speak. And then for the more mature business, it's, it's kind of embedding all those processes that maybe they have some of them, but maybe they don't, and really trying to help them kind of monitor their business and be aware of, oh, well, cash flow might be tight at the end of the month, but I can do something about it now because I know three weeks earlier. And if I need to take that loan, great, I can take it. If I don't, well, maybe I can move some other things around. So it's really kind of giving them that transparency and allowing them to make progress by themselves without kind of adding any confusion into into the experience. Or having so, to go to another provider or, yeah. or, or something like that. Yeah. So you're integrating with sources of data, which would allow you then to provide a product like a loan. And, and I think that's the absolutely the right way of thinking about it. The POS data sits at the bottom. You get all, all the transactions flowing through the platform. Then you add payments on top, so you're kind of validating the transactions. Um, and you know that those are real, like it's not cash transactions, which also th flow through the till as well. And then on top of that, it's all the embedded finance suite of products and all this extra value that you can add and tailor to the different use cases that we see. Can I just add a point? Uh, so when you think about what options small business owners have had in the past, they're quite limited, right? So historically, traditional banks have really demanded a lot from these small business owners. They've asked them to, I'll use capital as an example, they've asked them to bring two years of financial statements in and ask them to wait up to six weeks to be approved for a loan. And there's no guarantee they'll get the loan, right? So potentially they'll get denied, or even if they do get approved, it could be less for than less than what they want it for, right? Mm. So not meeting their needs. So these products, right, the products that Jason's talking about are really developed with a small business owner in mind. We can use that processing data, right, that system, that ecosystem that Jason was talking about to underwrite these customers and really provide them something, a pre-qualified offer that's really going to meet their needs. And that's just one example. But again, it's something that we really want to make sure that we're giving them access and then the other part of it also is the interoperability of these products. By having everything under the Epos Now roof, right, having all of these products together, the customer doesn't have to go and kind of Frankenstein together mm. their suite of products that they need to run their business. The capital funds can go into the business bank account available right away and then be spent on the issuing card. They have that visibility to really control their ins and outs, and just really take control of their financial their financial side of the business. So again, they can focus on what they love, which is baking the bread or selling the retail, right? So that's really at the core what these products are about, simplifying the experience so they can really focus on growing their business. And, and just back to your original point about adding being a global platform, Yeah, we took the capital solution and we rolled it into three markets all in one go. The experience is the same for the customer, whether they're in Australia, the US, or the UK, and just very quick go-to-market, really helpful for us as a platform to kind of scale up some of these extra revenue streams. And this is kind of fascinating, and you know, all of this is based on POS data right at the bottom of, of the stack. I suppose on the kind of 
embedded finance, maybe 1.0 or 2.0, wherever we are at the moment. I mean, you know, we heard about things like Merchant Cash Advance, for example, which is where you have a retailer selling on a particular marketplace, like, I don't know, Amazon or Shopify or something like that. And they can then use that data to then forward lend or what have you. But what's very interesting about this is it could, in your case, be any retailer. So long as they have that POS data, you can use that data to derive a, a credit lending decision, which is which is amazing. I mean, yeah, again, it's really about keeping the small business owner in mind, yeah. right? So we have a completely different underwriting model, right? We don't require that third party information. We understand what the inflow is in their business, right? And we can get super comfortable and we have a relationship with them, yeah. right? So it's, you know, through EPOS now, for instance. And so by doing that, we really just have the ability to give them a product that they need in a way that hasn't been done before. Yeah. That's amazing. And what what types of businesses would you say are most sort of adept at adopting this kind of stuff, Jason? We, I mean, we see all types of businesses. I, I don't think it's limited to single industries. Um, we recently ran a survey asking merchants kind of what did they use the money for? And it's across the board. Inventory, cash flow, some spend it on marketing. We see a small percentage of businesses, slightly larger businesses, that even take these kind of loans to open a whole new premises. So because their cash flow is so well known, you can offer them larger and larger sums of money. And then they just genuinely use that cash to grow the business. And because in essence, like you said, they're borrowing from themselves. If cash flow is poor one day or one week, it kind of doesn't matter. The amount you're taking off the top is still the same percentage. And you're not really impacting and putting their business at risk like a loan might. Yeah. Like, they're not due the set amount each month. So you can kind of flex with their business as, <coughs> as you need to. Yeah. And then also, um, I would just say, like, these products, like like Jason said, across all industries, right? Food and beverage, retail, beauty, health and wellness, professional services, uh, hospitality, you name it. As long as the small business owner wants speed, visibility, control over their finances so that they can run their business as efficiently and easily as possible, that's the sweet spot. Those are the types of businesses that are really going to be interested in these types of products. And they really just want to have that one hub to manage their entire business. And are you seeing any variance in um, geography, for example? So you mentioned three markets, I think. Are you seeing, you know, different businesses demanding different things? Or is it a question of actually, no, right now at this moment in time, an SME needs this? Um, I, I think you see differences in terms of the size of the business generally. So the... I think the need is the same across all the geographies, but if I'm a really small business, maybe I have different constraints and maybe if I've just started, I don't really want to go to the bank. Um, and then as those businesses scale up and we'll scale up with them by offering them kind of different packages and, and maybe kind of different add-ons and customizations to the, to the platform. But eventually they scale up fully and they get a finance team and and at that stage, maybe they do look for other providers yeah. be because suddenly they've got a team of people and they're truly optimized and everything that's embedded, well, that's okay for them, right? Like maybe they want our loan at one rate and they want something else at another rate from a bank um, and that's bound to happen. Hopefully we can scale with them at some point, but uh, at the moment we're more focused on the smaller guys. Yeah. Yeah. And when we think about the different geographies, agree, there's always like there's a baseline of the needs and the wants and the pain points for small businesses. It's important for us, though, at Adian to really keep an eye on that and make sure that it continues because we are a global partner. Yeah. And we want to make sure that when we're working with platforms such as Epos Now, we're able to provide that insight from everything from the needs and wants to also the regulatory compliance side and innovation, right? So having that baseline understanding of our customers is important, but then yep. we also keep a forward-looking lens on what's happening in the industry, what's coming down the line. It's important for us to provide that to, to our partners. Got it. Um, I'd like to talk a little bit about how you make money out of this. So, Natalie, I want to come to you first. You know, underwriting, you know, maintaining compliance, all of that kind of stuff, becoming a bank, let's say, is a very expensive thing to do. So how do you make money and remain profitable? Doing yes, this? absolutely. So I, I think there are two different parts to it. So first of all, this can be an entirely new revenue stream for a platform, yep. right? So if we take a step back and think about the payments ecosystem landscape, right, we have seen that some platforms actually are reporting more revenue from payments 
than they are from their SaaS business. Wow. And better finance is following in the same footsteps. When you think about it, there's so many different products and so much opportunity, right? So that's the first thing to keep in mind. The revenue stream, aside from the fact that you're meeting the needs of your customers, right? Providing them a super sticky value-added service. So that's the first piece. The second piece is just more tactically, like, what does it look like to run a single dollar pound euro through this entire ecosystem, mm -hmm. right? So with, if you start with payments, those are transactions that are coming to the customer because they're they're running their business in, in, in due course. If you take a dollar pound euro from a loan, right, or a, or a merchant cash advance, you're introducing a new you're introducing a new dollar pound euro into the ecosystem, right? So there's a fee there, right? So as a platform, there's a revenue share of some sorts, right? So that's uh, additional revenue. Then if it's deposited into a business bank account, you may be able to take advantage of some type of interest rate sharing. Let's say it sits there for a day, 10 days, because maybe they just wanted to have the funds before they needed to invest in their business to grow. There is that interest opportunity. Then you actually may be able to make some interchange off of that same that same income, right? That same inflow um, by having them spend the funds through an issued card. So all of a sudden, you've introduced new funds into your ecosystem and one plus one equals three. It's fascinating. It's a whole life cycle of fees. So how do you think about it, Jason? So on our side, we, we charge a subscription revenue mm -hmm. for the point of sale business. And then... On the on the tills on the on the point of sale machines, we have tens of billions of pounds going through those tills every year. Um, some cards on other people, some cards that are on us. Um, some of it's cash, and then just a mega long list of every single type of transaction type you could imagine. Um, and for us, it's it's how do we capture that into our ecosystem? This ecosystem of well, how do I get everybody to using our payments? And then how do I layer on top everything else? And what the merchant really wants is just transparency. They yeah. want fair pricing, transparency so they can see the sales data come in, the payments come in, the fees, everything is clear to them. They can reconcile at the end of the week, at the end of the month. They just want everything to be really simple. But then the layering comes into effect and some of that revenue we may need to share with merchants in terms of loyalty schemes. But it really is 1, 1 plus 1 equals 3. And eventually you're building so many new products for them that there's an underlying level of stickiness. You're getting so into their business that, well, I've taken the loan and I've got the bank account and everything works really, really well for them, that moving off this point of sale becomes more and more difficult. And ultimately there's a, a whole world of value there as well. Yeah, and it's fairer for the merchant. So although there are fees throughout a life cycle, I suppose overall it may be way more affordable than going to a bank and taking out a and, loan. And, and we can bundle some of those services together. Yes. So, so we we already started bundling some of the banking with some of the payment processing. And for certain merchants, if they're large enough, giving them a discount on payment processing as long as they're taking banking. So we're really trying to offer more value to the merchant and they can grow as we grow. And also keep in mind, these merchants, these small businesses are already figuring out ways to cover their needs and cover their gaps. And they are potentially paying a lot more by finding their own providers. So by putting it all under one roof, under one experience, it's actually a much better proposition for them because, there are, again, they're already doing it. These are not new costs to them at all. Yeah. Administering these partnerships is also very expensive for businesses. So just collating it into one is is very powerful. Okay. On that, we're going to take a quick pause here for a quick break. And it's all coming up after the super quick break. So don't go anywhere. Whether you're starting or scaling your company security program, demonstrating top-notch security practices and establishing trust is more important than ever. Vanta automates compliance for ISO 27001, SOC 2, GDPR and more, saving you time and money while helping you build customer trust. Plus, you can streamline security reviews by automating questionnaires and demonstrating your security posture with a customer-facing trust center, all powered by Vanta AI. Over 7,000 global companies like Atlassian, Flow Health, and Cora use Vanta to manage risk and prove security in real time. Our audience gets a special offer of $1,000 off Vanta at vanta.com forward slash insider. That's V-A-N-T-A dot com forward slash insider for $1,000 off. Ryan Reynolds here from Mint Mobile. With the price of just about everything going up during inflation, we thought we'd bring our prices 
down. So to help us, we brought in a reverse auctioneer, which is apparently a thing. Mint Mobile Unlimited Premium Wireless. Ready to get 30, 30, ready to get 30, ready to get 20, 20, 20, ready to get 20, 20, ready to get 15, 15, 15, 15, just 15 bucks a month. So give it a try at mintmobile.com slash switch. $45 upfront payment equivalent to $15 per month. New customers on first three month plan only. Taxes and fees extra. Speed slower above 40 gigabytes in detail. Welcome back to Fintech Insider Insights, where we're discussing the future of embedded finance. So before the break, we looked at the commercial opportunities within payment platforms and the situation of embedded finance right now. So now we're going to take a look at the technology shaping the future of embedded finance and quite frankly, well, what's next? So Natalie, I'm going to come to you first on this. What do you expect to be the kind of next milestones um, in embedded finance? And you know, why, why, why should a business get involved in this now? Why now? It's a great question. I think we're at a super exciting time in the life cycle of embedded finance. So if we take a step back and think about the evolution of platforms in general, platforms started roughly about 20 years ago, right, as the internet got a bit more mainstream. And these platforms started with their SaaS to meet the needs of merchant small businesses, right? That was the first evolution. Then, then they quickly realized that they could embed payments, and payments was something that they added as a new revenue stream. And that has become a lot more uh, common with these platforms. Embedded finance is running through the same exact trajectory, where we're at a bit of the beginning of the journey, right? There are some platforms that already are, have full programs, such as Epos Now, right, that they're really just taking advantage of the opportunity. There are a lot of other platforms that are just really starting to think about this, right? Maybe you've heard that another big player in their industry is, is has adopted a program. Um, so right now, we're at a point where it's a proven it's a proven suite of products but not everyone has adopted it so i think in the next several years we're going to see a lot more adoption from a platform perspective now what does that mean from a small business merchant perspective so we know that these merchants are already solving their pain points and needs cuz they have to right are they coming to platforms and asking them for some of these products and services most of the time they're not they may be to some degree, but I think over the next several years, we'll start to see small businesses and merchants really start to ask for these products to the point where eventually they'll start to expect it, right? And as that continues, we'll start to see a super, super sticky relationship between these small business merchants and the platform, right? So having that relationship really grow into a bond. Um, so again, right now, we're at a very interesting point where we have the proven use case, it's still not fully adopted, so now is a really good time for platforms to really start thinking about how they meet the needs of their customers, they show the value add, they create that super sticky relationship, and obviously add an additional revenue stream. And, and I think the, the ask on the platform eventually is, how are you taking these very generic use cases, holding money, banking, spending it on cards, getting cash, capital loans, any other offer there? How are you taking those and, and kind of packaging them up and customizing them to the merchant that you're serving? And how are you adding the value on top there? Epos now, we've, I mean, we've been doing this for two years already, so we feel like we're ahead of the game, but we fully expect the other providers to catch up. And, and our spin is, well, we need to continue to help the merchant and make sure they're successful because ultimately that's good for everyone. Is there a, um, a like a, a verticalizing play here? I mean, so when you have that stickiness and that consolidation, if that is the story now, Jason, you were talking a little bit about data. So the more of these needs and pain points, let's say that you're able to consolidate within one platform, the more data then you're able to see from the business and therefore the more things you can then do then for that, for that business. Is there something interesting there that in the future you could develop I, services for? I think there are many streams there. A few call outs. One is getting closer and closer to that profit and loss statement because ultimately that is that is the business. Yeah. And if you can help educate and, and slowly not take away that responsibility, but make sure they're aware of the changes in their business and aware earlier enough, then actually you can have a positive impact. And that might be through, I mean, stock programs. Are they going to run out and therefore they can't sell? Um, it might be through some level of pricing controls, like, hey, you're pricing this one. And actually, I don't know, the tea is mega underpriced and the coffee is mega overpriced. And, and are you aware that this is unusual? Um, and then also for, for certain 
sectors, say uh, cafe, getting closer to their courses. Like nobody, own, nobody is selling, nobody's buying the eggs for breakfast. Mm. Do you really need the chef every Tuesday? Like just giving them those kind of insights and packaging them up. And then I think eventually all these AI use cases sit over the top. And that's something that we're kind of pulling apart and exploring. Um, just having a bot there or some other types of interfaces that they can talk to and just understand what's happening beyond the, hey, here's a report that you need to check every month. Um, and really kind of pulling all the levers that you can with alerts and dashboards and all of this kind of extra stuff. Um, so I think that's where the industry is driving towards. It's It's kind of becoming the platform that the merchant uses to run their business end to end and not just this this hardware thing that they tap against um day in day out and if i can just add and build on on what jason said right because you talked a lot about like for the business a small business right which is at the core of what we do right meeting their needs from a platform perspective once you have a lot of different merchants on embedded finance you can start to spot trends and insights it may help you spot attrition faster it may help you spot hyper-growing businesses faster and you want to offer them certain products and services to really help that trajectory, right? So you can really get smarter and intimately closer to your customers by understanding what's happening from a 360 view like Jason talked about. It's so fascinating to hear you both talk about this because it feels like there is this convergence around the PL in the future. There's so many different businesses looking at it. banks are looking at trying to figure out how to do it themselves. You know, accounting software providers are figuring it out, or making partnerships together with platforms to try to figure out. There's this conversion around the golden nugget of the of the PL and the insights that come that come off the back of it. So and, and, and that's why, although maybe the pause space doesn't get talked about enough. You're the ledger for their business. That's like right. You have the space to play. Whereas the banks, yeah, maybe I spend on your card now and again. Like you're right there with them every single day, making sure that they can serve customers. Yeah, it's a primary source of truth, right? It's a primary, it's a primary record. I'd like to um, pivot the conversation a little bit um, into around how these partnerships actually work, right? How do they work? How do they come together? And what are the risks involved? So, you know, we've talked a, a lot, I think, on the pod, and there's been various different news items that happened over the last few years about some of the issues in the partnership space with the bass industry in the US, for example, and everything that's exploded over there. But what would you say, um, either of you, are the biggest sort of risks with these kind of platform integrations? Well, I said I would go in eyes open. Mm -hmm. and, and I think that means really... You don't have to understand every single nuanced fee from Visa, but you have to understand enough of the unit economics for each of those financial services that you can predict the outcome. Like if you're doing payments, well, you have to understand the integration, you have to understand the economics, what's interchange, what are the fees, how am I going to deal with chargebacks? Go in eyes open and understand that space and then slowly tick off each of the financial services in turn. If you don't do that up front and have some expertise in your business, either you throw everything over the wall and you're like, hey, partner, can you do this all for me? And they can't, right? Like you still have to run your own business. Um, if you go in kind of semi-planned, then something's going to get you eventually. Um, whether it's some compliance thing you didn't think about or some risk rule you didn't think about. But definitely pick the right partner. And I mean, Adian's been our partner like side by side for three years. And we're both in each other's space. Like they're very much, very close to how we run the business and we're very close to how all of the platform works. And I think that means that the collaboration is proactive and you really make progress very quickly. Uh, I can't agree more. Um Picking the right partner, I think, is crucial, right? So you, there are a few things that I would say are important to think about. We talked a little bit about keeping an eye on global trends and what's happening in the, in the different markets and regions. So you definitely want to make sure you have a partner that is fully aware of compliance and regulatory landscapes. And not only aware of it, but also are investing in keeping up to date because these things change so quickly in this environment, right? It's so crucial. You also want to make sure that you have the best experience. It has to be easy. It has to be easy or else you're going to be bogged down, right? So making sure that it is a simple um, partnership, right, where you have the a partner that's really invested in your goals and making sure that you grow together and customizable, right? One size does not fit all. 
Um, and then, of course, innovation, right? What's happening in this industry is is moving so incredibly quickly. I mean, if you think about what was happening 10 years ago, night and day, right? So making sure that you have a partner that's really invested in keeping up to date and at the forefront of all the changes that are happening in the industry. Absolutely. Um I want to talk a little bit also about the kind of maybe risks of data sharing, you know, because this is another thing that regulators are also looking into as well. I mean, are you seeing any, you know, upcoming regulation, for example, whether it's in the US or UK or EU, where there might be some sort of threats to the business model about how partners work together? Because I think the point that you've made, both of you, is extremely compelling in that the way that fintech is moving and, and is so powerful is through partnerships. It's through collaboration. We, we see this all the time. You know, I've heard of um, fintech sharing product roadmaps, for example, together, where they sort of co-build to the same overall destination. But is there, a, is there a counterfactual or some breaks that are happening in the industry to this that maybe is coming in from regulation or the market? So I would say that when you think about regulation, you have to remember that it's there to protect. Yeah. Right? And sometimes when we're in our day-to-day, it can feel like it's getting in our way because it's changing the way we're doing business today. But at the end of the day, it's really there to really protect either platforms, small businesses, or even banks. Yeah. Right? So just keeping that in mind, we find a way to be flexible because it's the right thing to do. So I wouldn't necessarily say it's a threat. I think would say it's more of an opportunity for providers such as Audi and for platforms such as Epos Now to stay nimble and really just make sure that you're on top of these trends so that you continue to meet the small business owner's needs. Absolutely. And I think some element of that is putting the customer first. Like the regulation is there to take care of the customer. As long as you understand where the regulation's moving, you can always put the customer first and make sure you're doing the right thing for them. Absolutely. Um, it's so it's so fascinating because you're right. At the end of the day, the business themselves has to maintain the responsibility for the compliance through throughout the journey. And in some ways, that is for all of the benefits that are involved. There are also risks there that businesses have to have to bear in mind. I think it's got to be a complicated environment for and, small businesses. And I think that ways. that risk element is also important to pull out. Like often these platforms, especially if they're SaaS businesses, they're selling a subscription. There's no downside. The customer leaves, fine, you lose the subscription revenue. But as you enter some of these partnerships, payments to start with and then getting more complex, there is downside. And again, they need to go eyes eyes open for that and just make sure the controls are there and they understand the landscape. Yeah, makes sense. In the In the final segment of the podcast, I'd like to maybe look a little bit to the future and just talk broadly about what embedded finance looks like in say five, 10 years from now. And maybe part of that story might be around how the incumbent financial organizations might be looking a little bit different because part of the story that we've been talking about here is in some ways banking, is in some ways consolidation and rebundling of business models into into new business models. So, So how do each of you see the sort of FS industry in the future, for example? I'll start with you, Natalie. So I'm super excited about it, right? So I think that we're moving towards simplicity, visibility, and control, right? These are core things that customers need and want to run their business. So again, they can focus on their actual business of either being um, a retailer or having a restaurant, for example. And so I think over the next several years, we're going to see the products get a bit more refined right, a little bit more adopted, right? Customers are going to start, merchants, small businesses are going to start expecting, wanting it from their platforms. And we're going to see an evolution where these small businesses are really empowered to have everything in one place so that they can very efficiently and easily run their businesses. And so I think if we say five to 10 years from now, I do think that platforms are going to be a cornerstone, like even more than they already are, a cornerstone to how small businesses actually operate and run. Um, Again, I think we're actually falling in the footsteps of payments yeah. and the platforms really just holding their their space in order to deliver the value that they need to to small businesses so they can focus on what's important to them. Awesome. I couldn't agree more on the payments angle. Like 10, 20 years ago, payments was hard. You'd have to be a specialist and you'd do all this API stuff and really have to deal in the weeds. And I think embedded finance will go the same way. Like it becomes easier, the commercials become easier, the operations become easier. And everything just kind of lifts up and matures. I think for the small business owners, the package is there, that all-in-one platform matures with it. 
And alongside that, you get specialization. So, I don't know, maybe the hospitality restaurant owner needs this one thing and right. he doesn't need something that the retailer needs. And slowly that kind of gets pulled apart. And, and actually, those more customized tooling helps people run their businesses better. I do think AI has some play yeah. there. Just back to the profit and loss statement and really helping the small business owner kind of manage their business day to day easily. Yeah, you're um, right. I think there is something there. I think AI is is still, well, generative AI still has some time to kind of bed in, but you can already see that there's something there. I think the point also that you're making, Jason, about this sort of niche, the niching, I don't even know if that's the right word, but you're seeing that in the vertical SaaS industry where you just have these businesses that just, I mean, take a, take a niche in, in business, I don't know, think think of something like managing tenants in a homeowners association. I mean, that's a big one, right? Just doubling down on services for that. Is is there also a question about payment types? I mean, this is something that comes out on the podcast quite a lot about, you know, in various different countries, there's lots of real-time payment networks around the world. There's open banking. I mean, just open thoughts about, you know, if we're looking five, 10 years into the future, would you see open banking payments playing more of a role? Or actually, are we saying, you know what, in the markets we operate in, say in the UK and Europe, there's not much there? I think there's always an opportunity, right? Because the concept of having payments within the platform as well as the embedded financial products means that you understand your customers from all different angles. But on top of that, let's be realistic. They may have other other relationships, and that could potentially supplement for a lot of different things, right? So potentially we could use open banking to better underwrite our capital loans, right? So that's the kind of thing that we're starting to think about, right? But again, I, I see it more as a supplement. Yeah. Um, in the future. Yeah. I'd love to see it speed up in the retail payment space, but I don't see the threads coming together in the next mm. few years at least. Um, yeah, there is work to be done there. There's work to be done. Yeah. yeah. And, you know, I know in the UK, the government's very keen for it, but I think sometimes we, it just doesn't, it just doesn't come together. Other countries, I mean, if you look at India, for example, it's absolutely ubiquitous. Um, but how does it all come together? Yeah, I think uh, this really highlights how we are at a pivotal point starting point with embedded financial products, proven use case, but there's a lot that we still need to work out. So now is a, a great time to be thinking about how do you establish your program? How do you yeah. really start meeting your customers' needs so that as these things occur, you already have an incumbent relationship with them um, and are just able to grow on that and be stronger. All right. And on that note, that wraps up today's discussion. Um, thank you so much for joining me, the both of you. This has been a fantastic conversation. And I mean... For the listeners who are not watching, we are all in person in the studio in London, which is the first time this has ever happened to me, to be honest. So that's kind of amazing. Um, so where can people find out um, more about you both? Natalie? Yes, please. I am on LinkedIn, Natalie Wexler. Uh, please connect with me on LinkedIn as well, Jason Downing. And if you want to find out more about Epos Now, please visit our website, eposnow.com. Amazing. Likewise for Adian, Adian.com. Yes, there you Thank go. You. Good plug. Yeah, <laughs> go do it. Um, and you can find me on LinkedIn at David BG. So thanks for listening, everyone. If you like what you've heard, follow our podcast and don't forget to leave us a review. It helps us to make it better and helps others find the show. As always, if you want to join the conversation, find us on social media. Just search for 11FS or Fintech Insider or email podcasts at 11FS.com. Thanks very much and goodbye. Whether you're starting or scaling your company security program, demonstrating top-notch security practices and establishing trust is more important than ever. Vanta automates compliance for ISO 27001, SOC 2, GDPR, and more, saving you time and money while helping you build customer trust. Plus, you can streamline security reviews by automating questionnaires and demonstrating your security posture with a customer-facing trust center, all powered by Vanta AI. Over 7,000 global companies like Atlassian, Flow Health, and Cora use Vanta to manage risk and prove security in real time. Our audience gets a special offer of $1,000 off Vanta at vanta.com forward slash insider. That's V A N T A.com forward slash insider for $1,000 off.